thank you for that introduction. Um, I would actually, I, I am now getting my PhD in computer science, um, which is you know, a far cry from a uh, literature degree, but things happen. And when I'm not speaking at academic conferences, which is uh, where I um, usually speak, uh, most of my talks are actually talks about science fiction uh, at sci-fi cons, uh, which is fine because this talk here is basically um, science fiction, just from a computer science perspective. Now, in the course of this talk, I'm going to touch upon a lot of CS theory, which I do not in any way expect you to remember. And for the sake of simplification, I will occasionally lie. Um, if you care about the nitty gritty of things, um, my colleagues and I have written several academic papers about this that you can look up, or you're more than welcome to uh, find me outside later and I will get a, you know, a pen, paper, uh, we'll do some math together. Um, but in order to get us started on um, this topic of automatic programming, I need to take a small detour, um, actually back to the 90s. In the first edition of Programming Perl, uh, Larry Wall famously named the three virtues of a programmer, uh, which are laziness, impatience, and hubris. Specifically, I'm going to talk a lot about laziness because that's what me and mine are here to support and empower. Now, when Wall was talking about laziness, he meant that the lazy programmer, the good programmer, doesn't do anything uh, twice. Because if you see that you're doing something manual more than once, you're going to stop and you're going to write some code for it. And if you see that you're writing the same code again and again, then you're going to stop and you're going to extract it out to some method, to some library. Um, but let's be honest. Most of us, most of the time, are too lazy to even do anything once. And that's OK. Uh, we'd rather save our energy for the things that matter, for the things that are hard, for the things that require our brain power. And that's where automatic programming, or what we uh, in the programming languages community called program synthesis, comes in. When we talk about automatic programming, we talk about a programmer, or maybe a power user like a data scientist that's working on a more algorithmic task and wants some of the uh, plumbing done for them by the computer. This is by no means a new idea. In the late 50s, Alonzo Church, which some of you may know as Alan Turing's pen pal, suggested that we can do this for circuits. And we do do this for hardware uh, nowadays, at least on some level. And in the late 60s and in the 70s, when the academic field focuses on applying formal methods to code and writing program verifiers and model checkers started taking off, it was only a matter of time before someone said, let's do this for code as well. And the idea looks uh, something like this. We have the specification of what we want the code that we don't want to write to do, and it's going to be written in some logic, probably a temporal logic, and then some magic happens, and we get code. Except no one wants to do that. We said we're lazy, right? And, and this is hard and long and hard to uh, write and hard to read and very error prone. What we actually want looks a little more like this. We want to say, make me a word processor, and then some magic happens, and then we get Microsoft Word, for instance. Which, of course, is really, really bad. Because if we have a hyper-intelligent program generation for anything our heart desires, that means that we're about to make self-aware, self-augmenting artificial intelligence. And that means we're on the brink of the technological singularity, which is the moment where artificial intelligence overtakes human intelligence and we are no longer useful to the machines. 
which is the moment where every philosopher and every science fiction author will tell you that we have no ability to predict what happens next anymore, but probably the robot apocalypse. Whoops. But don't worry, it's okay. That's not gonna happen. Well, it's okay for humanity, not so much for us lazy programmers. Um, but it's okay because in order to solve program synthesis, we need two things to happen. We need to be able to understand users, and we need to be able to build a program that does what it is they wanted. And the reason that we're safe because generating, uh, generalizing from partial intent is hard, and because solving the halting problem is hard. Well, technically it's a little bit more than hard, it's mathematically proven impossible, but we're about to start dealing in exponential algorithms and the difference between hard and impossible is gonna get really fuzzy really fast. Now, because of these, we'll never have real ideal program synthesis, but we should get to know these two things, our um, lines of defense against the robots, so to speak, because they're what we're gonna have to overcome if we wanna get better at this within reason. And we do wanna get better at this, and we can get better, of the, better at this. Uh, we can have IDE plugins that make uh, smart recommendations, like the one made by Kodota, um, out of Israel. Um, Chad, who's the next talk in this room, is going to uh, talk about them a little bit more. Uh, and we can have smart deobfuscators for JavaScript, like the one made in ETH Zurich. We can have intelligent bug repair, like they have Facebook. And we can have intelligent REPLs that I will show you a little later. Uh, we just need to understand the limitations to see where it is that we can go and when we understand where it is that we can go, we're also gonna understand why this is the route that we ended up going. So first, let's look at intent. Now, let's assume for a minute that anything that we can understand that the user wants, we can make a program for. So, you know, cut out half the equation for just a second. And remember how we started out here? Uh, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that the computer understands when we ask for something? How is it that we are expressing our intent? So one of the most common ways to provide intent is with examples. We, in the biz, uh, call this programming by example for relatively obvious reasons. Now, it's a very partial kind of intent, which is a little weird that we'd be using it, but it also makes a lot of sense. Uh, because it's a very natural way to provide specifications. As humans, we're good at examples. We're good at generalizing from very few examples and getting meaning out of this. This is how we explain things to each other. This is how we explain things to ourselves. So it would make a lot of sense that if we're building a tool to help us, we would want to explain to it the way we would explain to the person sitting next to us. But, the problem with this is that machines are not so good at the common sense aspect that tends to go into generalizing from examples. And that means that even the best effort to do this has just a few pitfalls. So let's look at this Excel for a second. Um, I'm sure our lovely speakers coordinator has one just like it lying around somewhere and it has all of the speakers and all of the, their talk times. And let's say she wants to uh, write us emails and make sure that we remember when our next talks are. So she goes to the first uh, row of the Excel, she starts a new column for message, and she uh, writes in, hi Simon, just a reminder, your talk is at 4.40. And now she has two options. She can go on and manually do this for uh, every single row, or she can apply flash fill. How many of you have heard of flash fill? 
Okay, one more than I expected. <laughs> so, FlashFill is a program synthesis tool out of Microsoft Research that was productized into Excel uh, back in 2013. And it's a programming by example. Uh, it actually started the field of programming by example as we know it today. It basically says we're going to look at um, input-output examples, where our inputs are, what, uh, are whatever is on previous columns in our row, and our output is the example that we gave in the one or two rows that we filled in. And we're going to look for a program that's a string transformation from whatever our inputs are to whatever the output is that we want. And then we're going to take this program and we're going to apply it to all the rows that we drag drop over. So we do that. And you know, at first glance, this is actually really impressive. We have, have hi and everybody's names and the time at the end. And this is, you know, not half bad. Except when we start looking a little bit closer, this is not exactly what we intended. So if we have hi, I know, just some minder, your talk is at 455, and hi, Sam, just a minder, your what's going on here? This is not what we wanted. And if I gave you that example, you would know exactly what I wanted, right? Well, what's going on here is that since computers lack common sense completely, uh, we have to put it in manually. And the way um, jumping to conclusions from partial intent uh, is implemented in Flashville is that we prefer substrings of our input over constants. So what's going on here is that the A in A reminder is the A in Allen as far as Flashville is concerned. Now, no one else has a hyphenated last name. So the A in A reminder just goes away for everyone else. Also, uh, the R in reminder is the R in rake. So everyone else, instead of reminder, gets the first letter of their last name. And you know, you're all smiling to yourselves because this is kind of silly, but it's bad. And not only bad, it's kind of dangerous. I mean, uh, we noticed it here because it's right there in front of us, and it is a little subtle, but we noticed. What happens if the first manifestation of whatever is not we intended is to scroll windows down. And it's actually so bad that nowadays um, Excel guides really caution you against using Flashville, uh, which is really a shame for us, considering that they're our you know, first serious ambassador out into the world. But what about different kinds of intent? Um, you know, when you're faced with doing that something that everyone has done before you and now you have to do yet again, like fetch from the DB or send a get request or um, clean up some resources. And you know, you go to Google and then you find the first Stack Overflow post that looks about right and you copy out of it and you paste into your code and you don't tell anyone that you did that. Um, what if we wanted to encapsulate that kind of intent. I mean, surely all we're trying to do is replace a Google query or two, right? By maybe turning to something that has some knowledge of the code or of the library that we're using. Now, it turns out the language models, uh, the kind that do the autocomplete on your phone, when applied to code instead of natural language, do this pretty well. So if we have a query like, I would like to apply some function food that I already wrote to requests to my server, um, and I actually would phrase it like, I have this Scala code here that kind of uses the Akka library, but I have some hole in it that, where I don't know what to do. A language model would do relatively well at filling this hole for you with something that would work. Except it's still not necessarily that great because if what you wanted to do is not the absolutely 
most popular thing to do. Even language models that rely on probability, on learning what other people have done before and applying the same thing here are going to help you because this is still very, very partial, very ambiguous intent. And really, it's commit strip, um, who've said it best before me uh, when talking about kinds of intent. If someone tells you, you know, someday we won't even need coders anymore, we'll be able to just write the specification and the program will write itself, you can always just turn around and say to them, oh, wow, you're right, we'll, we'll be able to write a comprehensive and precise specification and bam, we don't need programmers anymore. And do you know the industry term for a project specification that is comprehensive and precise enough to generate a program? Code. It's called code. And all we're trying to do is find something that's going to let us get away from writing code. And in the back of our minds, that's always going to be there. Now, what happens on the other trajectory? What happens um, with building a program? Now, let's say for a second, um, make the other assumption. And we can understand any intent, and we just want to find a satisfactory program for uh, the user for whatever it is they wanted. So let's say the user walks up to the computer and says, please get me a program that takes a program and an input and tells me if that program stops on, the, on that input and sends the computer off to look for a solution to the halting problem, which is, of course, not solvable. Which, by the way, if you think about it, is realistically how Kirk would have dealt with that evil supercomputer in that episode of Star Trek because sending it off to solve the liar's paradox is just a cop out. This is how a real programmer would have done it. But okay, let's adjust our expectations um, a little bit. And let's look for, first of all, for a program that we know exists, no more solving the halting pro problem for us. Um, and let's even say we're going to work, um, we're, we're gonna look for a, a program in a language that's very, very small. Either it's a really, really, um, expressive domain-specific language or a subset of some language that we care about. And so we're not even a real, in a realistic setting anymore, right? Uh, we kind of already solved the problems in our head and now we found some language or some subset of a language that um, our solution lives in. And you know what? Let's even take another... Um, assumption for ourselves, let's say the program is very, very small. So its tree is gonna be maybe height of three, teeny tiny program. So we say, okay, um, in this very, very restricted context, go find this program that does what I want, that I'm certain exists. And now the computer is gonna go look for a program. And the way it's generally going to do that is to look at every program and see uh, whether it works out for us. And it's gonna build uh, more and more program trees either from the root down or from the leaves up. And so we're gonna look at all the programs of, um, all, all the programs of height one and then all the programs of height two and then so on and so forth for something around, let's say, 13 trillion, 311 billion programs or so in order to see all of the programs of height three where we know our program lives. And let's say we even have a really efficient um, server that does this at, I don't know, 10K programs a second, which is a pretty good rate. So we'll only be waiting for it for about 15,000 days. Uh, it's not that bad, right? Um, so how do we... Um, even take this astronomical number of programs uh, and reduce it down to something that we can even consider. Maybe we can get rid of some of them and, and not even try to consider them. Um, more on this soon. So um, what does this all mean? Well, generally it means that uh, please, computer, find me a program that does whatever cannot be solved. 
which is good, right? No robot apocalypse, we all get to live, we just have to work a little harder when we're coding. But it's okay, we're not gonna give up, at least I'm not gonna give up because I would like to get my PhD eventually and it's on this. Um, we're gonna have to have realistic expectations um, and do a realistic version of program synthesis. What do realistic expectations look like? Well, first of all, we want to see what, what do we still want? What can we not live without? We want partial specifications because if, we want to, if we're going to completely fully specify every aspect of our program, we might as well be writing the code ourselves. We want to not have to know everything about the language that we're working with or the API that we're working with. Uh, we want um, non-trivial steps to be made for us by the automatic tool. And we want to get a result eventually. What can we live without though? We can uh, live without checking every possible program along the way. In fact, we have to live without checking every possible program along the way. Uh, we can live without a fully uh, automatic solution. And we can live without a single step solution. And what these last two together mean uh, is that we're going to have to get the human a little more involved. We're not going to succeed immediately and all at once. We're gonna need a little bit of help. So we're going to make small steps for the human who's going to maybe make some small steps themselves and we're going to work iteratively. Now to do this, we need two things. We need a synthesis engine, which is essentially a model of what we know about the programming language or the API, what we know about the world in which we're looking for a program and how to look for a program. And we need an interaction model, which is an effective way to work with the engine to make sure the engine is helpful to us rather than just frustrating to us. Now, the synthesis engine, well, should be everything we just said we would like out of a synthesis engine. It should predict code given some intent. It's going to have an understanding of the world that it draws from language syntax or the wisdom of the programmers who came before or semantic specification or some of or all of the above. And it's going to do magic in order to reduce the number of programs that we have to look at. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into what goes on here because it's just a rabbit hole of theory um, with heuristics and about three different schools of thought and warring, fa uh, warring factions. Um, but I do wanna delve for a second just into the last item, uh, reducing the number of programs seen. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it, but there's two ways that I personally find uh, particularly cool. And the first one actually starts off with a very naive and reasonable concept. Let's not look at programs that we've already seen just in a different way. We're gonna get rid of a lot of programs that we're not gonna consider if uh, we know something about equivalence. If we've seen x plus y, let's not see y plus x if X and Y are numbers. Um, if we saw a list, let's not see the reverse of its reverse. This is a program that we kind of know for a fact that we don't care about, right? Well, how can we do that? Because uh, program equivalence happens to be undecidable. Well, we have three options. The first option is to throw heuristics at it as you occasionally do. Um, we happen to know something about plus about numbers. We happen to know something about how uh, zero behaves. Uh, we happen to know that reverse of reverse uh, is the same thing. Another thing we could do is use uh, SMT solvers. Now SMT solvers um, like Z3, which happens to be uh, my personal favorite but is 
but by no means is the only one, are a nifty little thing. Um, they're an expansion on SAT solvers that add theories, the theory of numbers, the theory of arrays, uh, and basically let us put in some logic and get a result whether the formula we put in is satisfiable or not. And if we have some semantic information about how the components in our language behave, we can encode them for a solver and get back some information about whether or not uh, two programs are equivalent for very, very, very simple programs. The third thing we can do is called observational equivalence. And to explain observational equivalence, I'm actually going to have to take a step back and ask, what is equivalence? What does equivalence actually mean? And equivalence means that we're behaving the same on every input, right? If we took a step back to, or um, let me put up a super mathematical definition. P1 is equivalent to P2 if for every possible input ever, they happen to do the same thing. Now, that's obviously undecidable, right? Because for instance, it's enough that we have strings here and we have infinitely many inputs ever. Um, but do we really care about every input ever? You know, in our guts, yes. But let's for a second consider the radical notion that no, we don't. And try this out for size. We're going to say that two programs are observationally equivalent if for every input that the user cares about, they behave the same. And this, of course, assumes that the user has expressed caring about an input somehow, for instance, by giving us some tests or some examples that give us inputs that they happen to care about. Now, why is this OK? The first reason that it's OK is that if the user doesn't care about the behavior of some input, so it's not in their tests, why should we? We might be uh, not giving the absolute ideal program, but we are making sure to satisfy everything the user said that they care about. The other reason that this is OK is that it actually works. So our 13 trillion programs from before, because we're building smaller pro uh, larger programs from so smaller programs, Every time we get rid of a program at some level, because we've already seen something that's equivalent, either on the same level or just smaller programs even that are um, equivalent, that's thousands or millions of programs that we're not going to have to look at that use it as a component. So our 13 uh, trillion programs from before are going to turn into 100,000. And that's now something that we can actually consider. Still a lot of hard work, but reasonable amount of work to do. And for a lot of limited domains, for uh, synthesis that works over domain-specific languages, um, for instance, uh, SQL queries, this can actually be enough for us to say, uh, we're now doing a reasonable amount of code, uh, uh, amount of work uh, to get code, and we can stop here and not you know, uh, do anything else other than this in order to make our problem tractable. The other option is to try, yeah, the other option is to try a whole other uh, strategy and say, well, we're not going to look at programs as constructs that stem from the language grammar anymore. We're not going to consider them as trees. Instead, we're going to have some knowledge base, and we're going to get programs out of that knowledge base um, and put them together somehow. And so we're no longer going to see every, other, uh, every possible program in the language uh, because we're only going to see what our knowledge base represents, which is OK, because we didn't before. We shrank our language down to like a really teeny tiny size before anyways. 
So what can we do? Uh, we can take knowledge about an API, for instance, and condense it into things that we can explore in a reasonable amount of time. The top thing up there um, that does things with um, graphical libraries is a work out of uh, UT Austin that uses Petrie nets, of all things, um, in order to represent an API. And um, the bottom one is a probabilistic automaton that can then be translated into a language model that's been used in a series of works out of the Technion and ETH Zurich. And now we can, uh, th now that we have these models, we can search them with graph algorithms or with probabilistic equations in order to get a program um, that satisfies whatever it is that we want to do. So a lot of work has gone into synthesis engines um, very seriously for about the last 15 years on reducing the number of programs that are considered, on uh, acquiring knowledge, um, because these models take a lot of effort to build, um, if, which is, you know, the work has to go somewhere if they're easier to query, and on finding uh, different ways to check that the program that we're considering at the moment is or is not right. What was very rarely considered before is what would the usability of the model working against these things look like? which is where we come to the most important part, which is the interaction model. Or at least I think it's the most important part because it's my work, so of course I think it's the best thing ever. And one of the things that I think is it's important to narrow ourselves down to programmers because then we can be more specific and let programmers that use our tools do better. Why would we ever want to use a coding assistant that can write small chunks of code for us that doesn't treat us as though we're programmers who uh, you know, actually know how to deal in code. So the interaction model should let us specify intent, obviously, because without specifying intent, we've got nothing, but express ourselves as programmers and think as programmers. And of course, take into account that this is going to be a process rather than a one-shot thing, because we're doing something that's really hard, we're gonna to have to do it incrementally. Now, we already looked at examples for intent, and the problem with them is uh, that they're very, very ambiguous when a machine considers them. So for instance, if we wanna find the median of a list, um, and the user uh, tells the tool, oh, 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 I'll just give you examples like I would uh, when I'm talking to my buddy, for one, two, and three, the median is two, and for seven, eight, seven, three, the median is seven, you obviously now know what a median is, go find me some code. And the, the synthesis engine now comes back with, if you take um, your input variable at length divided by two, um, the element there is the output you wanted. This is obviously median, this is how you explain median to me, right? So we already said that this is going to be a process. And our user is obviously going to be a little unhappy and um, th that they're now gonna have to adjust the specification, the, the way that they explained uh, what they want. The thing is, if we're only dealing with examples, what's gonna happen now? Well, the user is gonna say, okay, why did I get this program? Well, it turns out that there's a, um, that the result happens to be in a, um, cell in the list, the element in the list, that's describable by a single formula for location. So that's not good, and now I'm gonna have to make a new example where that doesn't happen. In this case, it's kind of trivial. Once I figured out what happened, um, if we're looking at larger programs, not so much. Which brings us to the first principle of interaction models uh, for program synthesis which is the cost of communi communicating intent, that is explaining to the synthesizer what I want, plus the cost of consuming the result, that is reading the program, understanding it, and figuring out what I want to do next, should be considerably less than the cost of just doing it myself. Because if this is going to be too hard, the user's just gonna say, ah, 
never mind. Just I'll, I'll get it over with. Um, do it myself. Now, examples really are swell. They're a good tool. Um, just when we're talking about developers that are looking at a program, we can do more. The reason that I um, beat up Flashville uh, before, and I did make an, uh, um, you know, something of a career out of jumping up and down on Flashville, which is really good work. Uh, the reason that I think that it's a cautionary tale is because they don't show you a program. All they do is they take a program that exists behind the scenes and they run it. And they never ever let you judge what is actually happening, only what is observable to you um, from its effects. And if this thing that we don't like was um, shown to us as a program, we might say, well, this bit here, if we think about it, is actually where the median is going to end up, right? I mean, it's, it's the middle of uh, the array. So this bit is actually good. I, I, I want to keep it for later. The problem is I don't want this called on the input directly. Something needs to be done to the input before. And this is, if you think about it, kind of code review-y like feedback. I want to be able to do code review with my now automatic programming partner. So let's take these things that are very natural to us as programmers, um, you know, uh, um, remarking on other people's code, and fold them into our uh, interaction model along with examples. Let's say uh, we call this retain, keep this bit, and exclude, get rid of this bit. And just a note for fun, um, adding operations like, the, like these severely affects what goes on um, in the engine when we're trying to reduce the number of programs, um, each in its own interesting and slightly horrible way. But it does bring us to uh, principle number two, which says, let developers be developers. And when we say let developers be developers, sometimes that means we also have to force them to stay developers. Because it's really easy to you know, kind of get out of the zone, um, even if you're sitting there and looking at code, if you're not really looking at code. There was an experiment that was done uh, where the synthesis engine was one that could just predict the few next tokens at a time. Um, just recommend uh, um, a little bit, small, small chunks. And let's say that our user wants to take a list of strings and produce just the counts of each string. So they go, you know, my uh, list variable dot control space for completion. OK, well, um, group by looks like something I want to do if I want to count things that are the same, right? So tab, control space again. Identity, yeah, sounds about right. Tab, control space, tab, control space, tab, 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 tab. And we're no longer programs, programmers at this point. We're just like point and click type users. And at some point, the user wakes up and says, I don't know what this code does. I have no idea how I got here. This is just, what is this? Just deletes everything and writes, writes it themselves. And of course, goes on the internet and tells everyone our tool is terrible. So we really need to be able to keep the user's head in the game if we want to help them. And for the very same reason that we, uh, we want to make sure that nothing wild happens, or at least that the user can question what just happened um, if something that they don't understand just took place. And this is the reason that I, as a person who deals in interaction models, um, essentially, really, really don't like the um, deep synthesis type of solutions for the synthesis engine, where we'll train a neural network in whatever way and ask it to predict code for us. Because if you ask 
um, a neural model. How did you get this program that you're, just, you're now recommending to me? Um, what were you thinking when um, you came up with this? You get this. And this is not really going to help anyone, the, the state of the, inter uh, the internal variables of the network. And sure, a, a language model doesn't really look ever so much better. When uh, you're doing probabilistic language model type completions, like I talked about before, but there you're not actually, this is not your answer to how did you come up with what you told me. There we're actually talking about a specific path through this enormous thing. Um, you know, 80% of the users who had a file handle in their hands um, called open, and then 60% of those did seek, and then 45% went into a loop, and this is the reason you got this series of recommendations. And that brings us to principle number three, which is the results must, must always be explainable. And even if your model doesn't explicitly um, include an operation that says, you know, explain this to me, how did this actually happen? The ability to rationalize what you're looking at and at least kind of, you know, get used to the tool and kind of reverse engineer it in your head, like we do with a lot of tools that we use all the time. Um, you know, th that's really, really important for, for developing trust with your user. And it's also really important that uh, programmers are um, on their game and always know what's going on and always um, are able to rationalize because ultimately they're the ones in this iterative game back and forth of specification program, specification program that get to decide when we're done. Which too um, is something of an issue. Remember, uh, Larry Wall's uh, virtues that I started out with. The third one is hubris. And boy, is hubris sure a programmer quality, isn't it? And one of the things that translates into um, is that we're not very good, not only at seeing our uh, own mistakes, but seeing our uncertainty and handling our uncertainty properly. And if you accidentally end up, taking, uh, end up taking away a user's crutch, you get some very interesting results. And we found this out accidentally. Um, the very first user study that we did um, of extending the interaction model with just the two operations that I mentioned before, retain and exclude, we had um, our control group doing programming by examples, so they only had examples with which to talk to the synthesizer. We had a group that only had retain and exclude, and we had a group that had everything at their disposal. And it turns out that the people who were thinking in examples, the people who were thinking, if I give it this input, I want this output to come out, I want, I, I'm looking at the edge cases, I'm really thinking about what the code is executing, we're pretty okay at deciding when um, the program they're looking at is the correct solution um, for the task at hand. You take examples away, you only leave people looking at code and considering it um, syntactically. That goes away so fast. That's the orange people over there, and that's just like whew, total dip in correctness. You give them back examples, goes back up again. Because we think we're really good at looking at code and knowing what it does. We are so not. So one of the things that we learned is that the best way to counter this is to keep explaining yourself to the user again and again, even sometimes if they didn't ask. Now, we wanted to um, do this, or take everything that we've learned, and throw it into one of the better loved interaction models out there, which is the read eval print loop, which is how I'm guessing most of us in this room um, work on something tiny to the side that we want to make sure is correct before we throw it into our larger bit of code. 
And we really wanted to see if we can fit all of these conclusions um, into that. OK. And what we came up with um, is a tool called Wrestle, read a val synth loop, which basically throws um, a synthesis step as a possibility for something that you could do. And this one synthesizes JavaScript code and helps you solve some uh, competitive programming tasks. So for instance, let's look at one of them. Um, cre uh, create a function that takes a number and returns an array of strings containing the number cut off at each digit. So 420 should return 4, and then 42, and then 420. Um, all of them, uh, all of them strings. So the first thing that I want to do, actually, is to not only have my examples be, you know, something that I think about vaguely. I want them right in front of my face. So I'm going to put them right in front of my face. And immediately I get the evaluation of um, my code, which I start out with just input, returning my input, uh, on every example that I give it. So I'll give it both of these. OK. Now, I'm a um, Python Scala person. So the way that I would solve it is I would say, well, I want to range over um, the number of digits. And then I'll take my input, I'll turn it into a string, and I'll chomp off the right number of characters for every element in the range, right? Well, problem is, I don't know how to do range in JavaScript. In fact, it's so weird and convoluted that I've given this demo a fair number of times at this point, um, mostly to participants and the study that we did on this, because this is brand new. This is, this is work that was finished about 20 days ago. So you're like the second people to see it. Um, so I, don't, I, I haven't actually had to remember how to do this, because the tool is going to do it for me every single time which, you know, bonus for me. I get to be mentally lazy. Excellent. But let's assume for a second that I had a range. I had 0, 1, 2, and that's the range that I want, uh, that I would have for 420, right? So all I have to do is map over it and say string representation of the input slice out this number of characters. OK, well, that's almost entirely what I wanted, right? And I can actually look and see, well, for 420, I am getting input dot to string is doing exactly what I think. But slice is, well, slicing from 0 to 0 gives me a string of length 0, so obviously I have an off by one error. And notice that I'm giving you as much information as I possibly can about what's going on in the program so that uh, you can't say, oh, wait, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to disconnect from what's going on here code-wise. OK, so to fix this, I actually just want a one-based range, right? And let me even. Um, jump in there and make sure I don't have an off by one error on the other end. So if I had the right range, so one, and th one to three and one through four, my first and last elements look fine. OK, so I'm fairly confident in everything that goes on after the range I don't have. So let's just fix this bit and say, well, this bit here, fix it for me. And I've just focused in to this one little bit that I want fixed so that all of these examples really, really work. But I know more than that. I know more than that this is the bit that doesn't work. What I know is that this bit, 
the length of the string representation is good, right? I want it as part of my computation. I want, I want it to be part of the length of my range. And now I can say, well, run little gerbil. And the little gerbil runs and comes back with this horrendous bit of code right here that actually creates the ranges that I needed, which is the reason that some 20 demos in, I don't have to remember how to do that. And the people who um, participated in our study, some of them people who never programmed in JavaScript before, used this to pick up on things that they didn't really know how to do, like, I don't know how to get the length of the string representation, so let me just have that work, out, work it out for me, instead of just like trying out dot len, len, uh, len parentheses my expression, and just so on and so on, or alternately Googling it. We didn't let them Google. We were very, very evil people. So where does that put us? Well, you can have somewhat intelligent program generation for some needs. And because we're not going to do the overly intelligent stuff, none of that bad stuff is going to happen. And I don't know where this field is going to go in the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years, but it's been going so fast that I can't really make predictions. But ultimately, probably to profit. Thank you very much.